Good morning to everyone. So you know that I have a Im Mission Impossible task to try to share with you in 15 minutes <laughs> the eight-month journey that we uh, did to produce this research that will be serving as inputs to the agenda building or the hard labor we will undertake in the next three days. Before I actually go to the main results of the survey, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my friends, I, um, some of the respondents of the survey for the Philippines are here with us. Uh, I cannot name you all as I have very little time, but I also wanted to acknowledge the resource uh, persons or key informants who were very nice enough to spend more than an hour or even more to share with us their perspectives on the state of social enterprises in the Philippines. So with that, um, I will go and move forward to the main theme. Um, before I joined uh, ICA for this research, I thought uh, I knew something about social enterprises. Uh, little did I know, uh, and there's, there's a lot I didn't know and understand, but I am grateful to have been part of the research because now I think I have a better grasp and a better appreciation of what Social enterprises, most of you, some of you are heads of these enterprises are doing and have done a lot in the last decade or so. Reduction, alleviation, or improving the quality of life specific, uh, of specific segments of the poor and have a distributed enterprise philosophy. In the earlier study of uh, uh, Professor Gakanai, she also noted that there are two types of services that this a specific type of social enterprise are providing the poor. They are the transactional and transformational services. Transactional services are defined as those that help uh, benefit the enterprise and keep capacitate the poor to become better workers, clients, or suppliers or producers. Transformational services are those that uh, capacitate the poor to become active or more conscious agents of their own poverty alleviation. So um, I don't have much time to, but I think if you read the voluminous <laughs> handout that is in your kit, you will have a better appreciated understanding as uh, I did. Okay, uh, the other framework we took, adopted for this research is of course Oxfam's Women Economic Leadership Framework, which has these three elements. Securing economic resources, gaining power in markets, and changing attitudes and beliefs to enable equal relations with men and women in economic decision making. Now, the research had uh, several parts. The first part is the rapid appraisal, where we interviewed key actors in the social enterprise sector. Some of you were interviewed by me or by my other colleagues. And then we also have the survey, and uh, two parts. Um, and then we have the uh, case studies of five chosen social organizations that highlight certain aspects of sex. Now, for the um, sample, the survey respondents, uh, we, they were chosen, first of all, um, the selection criteria, 50% should be focused on women, and then they should be sig exhibiting significant outreach exhibiting significant qualitative impact on the poor served and exhibit pioneering or significant potential if they are a new social enterprise. So we tried to make a, a database of about 100 plus institutions and from there we took uh, those, selected those that fit the criteria and sent out the survey questionnaires to them. So only a um, handful, however, were able to complete the daunting uh, questionnaire, but uh, out of the 73, we were able to get 32 for a response rate of 44 for organizational studies, which is higher than the average or, uh, rate, which is at 35. So we thought, well, that's nice. <laughs> okay, now, so uh, let's highlight who were um, composed, who composed the uh, survey respondents. So we were able to get six we call social mission-driven microfinance institutions, social cooperatives, FTOs or fair trade organizations, 
and uh, travels or trading and development organizations. So non-government development organizations are uh, come under the travels also. And then you have the new generation social enterprises. So the segments of the poor being reached by these enterprises are the farmers, agriculture workers, fishers, enterprising poor indigenous, poor informal settlers, persons with disabilities, and out of school youth. And um, the social mission driven MFIs have reached a 2.5 million clients, approximately. Okay, that's, um, and then you have social cooperatives numbering about 11,000 uh, and reaching about 4.5 million poor or 2.5 million low income households. In terms of the fair trade travels and the new gen SEs, which we estimate, it's a very uh, rough estimate at 11, at 1,500. As of now, we don't really have a comprehensive database on all the NGOs, all the travels, or even all the MFIs operating in the country. So at best, uh, these are estimates, and uh, we're basing it from the 2007 rapid appraisal that in an earlier study uh, of uh, Professor Dachman. Okay, now regarding the actual respondents of the survey research, in terms of legal forms, 50% are non-profit, 22% cooperatives. Um, development levels in terms of level of development as, as a social enterprise 62% based on their self-assessment are already developed or mature and 56% um, and 6% that are already clear and in the process of implementation <coughs> organizational nature we have 66% with complex organizational structure meaning we have uh, an example of course the microfinance institutions that started as just a single or primary and now have several branches or in fact you have institutions that are now have what you call mutually reinforcing organizations okay. and median age of the steps that we uh, were able to get in the sample 14.3 uh, 14 years the CEO's age 51 years old <laughs> is the average and their average length of engagement is about 14.45 years. So as you would guess, most of them are, the CEOs are, the founders or what you call the lifers. So um, there you are. And uh, in terms of economic background, 88% uh, are actually with college degrees, PhDs, and masters. Now 100%, looking at um, the, or the SEPs, most of them, we, we looked at the vision, mission, and goals and objectives are working towards poverty reduction and improving the socioeconomic conditions of the poor. Yes? Median age, 14.3 years. This is the number of years of organization? Yes. Okay. In terms of the solutions to social issues, um, Financing and related services was among the top um, answer that the SEPs pro uh, gave as their way of addressing poverty or improving the socioeconomic condition of the poor, followed by organizational enterprise development support at 41%. So uh, we were saying that we, we wanted to focus on SEPs or social enterprises that have poor as a primary stakeholders and that they are social mission driven organizations. So well, this is one of the things that we looked at in uh, uh, among the SEPs that uh, were able to answer in the study. Now in terms of the financial profile, 50% were set up for less than $70,000 which of course represent the share of the capital of cooperative members. That's less than 3 million pesos. So when they started, they were all micro. And 13% of the capitalization was between 70000 and $350,000. And 34% were personal investments of the founders and owners, 16% only from grants from development and social investor. And there's nil zero investment from the development agency or from the 
public sector or from government. So, meaning uh, the personal stake or the risk of the funders, founders, I mean founders, and of course partly the uh, funders, uh, was a lot more. So in asset size, we have 35%. This is now uh, of the SEPs are medium and 16% are small. So from being micro, those uh, this uh, social enterprise have already grown from being micro to medium and small. So, and 56% of these SEPs were saying uh, finance their, the delivery of their services or their products from their profits and revenues. 78% are already have regular staff, indicating the formality, level of formality of their businesses. So these are no, no longer your small uh, NGOs or cannot even pay decent wages to their staff, but they are actually uh, formal businesses. So in terms of the main services, I'm only highlighting the top um, ones that uh, the SEPs provided are training, capacity building, skills development across all segments of SEPs, whether they are fair trade, trados, or new gen, or cooperatives and MFIs. They're all providing in some way or form training or capacity building of uh, the poor. Which brings me to mind that um, in the framework, the SEPs as defined is actually anchored on definition of poverty as capability <coughs> deprivation from Martinson's um, framework. And it's beyond monetary or low income, which would help us appreciate why across this type of social enterprises, capacity building uh, ranks as highest or the one that is provided first or always in, con um, in combination with other services like finance and uh, microinsurance or even health. So financial services, credit insurance is the second uh, main service and product development and marketing next. Um, what is um, very insightful here is that um, when we ask how many are, are asking the poor to pay for these services, training and capacity building services, no fees for 66% of the SEPs product and development and marketing, 34%, and basic social services, 37%. So there's no charge. So really it's clear that they are being provided for from their own revenues. In terms of services for women, since we're talking about women economic leadership, of the, the SEPs, 31% provide uh, entrepreneurship and business development, livelihood, and financial literacy trainings. For MFIs, I think this always goes hand in hand with the um, financial services. 19% microfinance and financing for enterprise. Now, in terms of engagement and impact on the poor, uh, I tried to just highlight the top ones, um, which are directed towards a specific objective in terms of enabling the poor as effective workers, suppliers, and clients. And you have here the percentage of steps that are providing the specific program and service. And then you have the number of poor that are served. Since uh, I have this mission impossible to try to share with you as much, uh, I just tried it to. I decided to just put up on the table. But um, in summary, actually, you have the, the just the third 32 million enterprising poor. So just the, this particular segment, 37 percent of the steps are reaching this poor. Um, in terms of impact, this is of course again based on self assessment. Um, the 44% of the SEPs say, say that they have, um, the poor have gained increases in monthly household income, and they have uh, improved their capacity to cover their basic household needs, and they were able to undertake new alternative sources of income. In terms of contribution to community development, you have, of the SEPs, 37% assisted to the poor to set up their own organizations. So beyond being a recipient or beneficiary, there are certain steps that actually help the poor to set up or organize their own in, um, organizations. 40% of those uh, steps say that the, the poor they engage with gain or improve their self-esteem. 
and self-worth. Uh, and 31% had improved status of women in the community. And then we have the other, of course, impact. In terms of challenges, okay, these are the, uh, again, on the assessment of the, both the CEOs and the um, SETS staff, 69% um, say that access to appropriate technologies is one of their uh, top uh, challenge. When we say access to technologies, mo not actually your mobile or gadgets, but it, for the TRADOS, <laughs> it's more uh, appropriate machinery, equipment to improve efficiency in production and all those. So maybe I uh, was lacking in a better term for this, but uh, that's what uh, they actually mean or we're referring to. 66% achieving financial viability and sustainability, 62% measurement of social outcomes, and 59% leadership and management capabilities required by scaling up, and 56% access to adequate financing. So as you can see, in the internal challenges are <laughs> quite varied and it cuts across the board. Um, in terms of the external, there are just two things that um, were foremost in the mind of SEPs, and that's the climate change, uh, extreme weather disturbances. Is a number of those SEPs are working with agricultural, uh, with farmers, fishers, uh, IPs, um, um, planting coffee and all sorts. So, and then 59% government policies negatively affecting SEs. <coughs> I'm over by about a minute, but I'm gonna finish soon, so hang on. In terms of potentials, so where did we get this uh, data? Um, we tried, because we sit here, we have to assess the roles, the potentials are uh, four, one of which is the quite a very, a very big institution that reaches already more than 2.3 million um, poor. Okay, some of the, the numbers of the poor are, may have overlaps, since we have not really completed our client mapping <laughs> initiative, so we, there may be overlaps, but in terms of the reach, uh, there are, uh, it's actually half of the 4.2 million poor families in 2012 based on PSA's estimates, so the statistical authority. In terms of poverty reduction targets, some of the things that gives, gives us insight on the way um, the SEPs actually try to measure how they move the poor out of poverty, 80% of those below the $1.25 poverty line will be moving to the $2 a day poverty line. So, and this particular institution is targeting half a million. So that's just to give us an indication of the, the scale of uh, how they want to make an impact on poverty reduction. In terms of capacity development targets, 40% of the SEPs target livelihood generation while 61% aim to improve business implementation or social enterprise development. Um, this one uh, has already been mentioned earlier, uh, and we will have a plenary later, so I will not spend too much time on the conclusion <laughs> on that. So in terms of what we have uh, tried to accomplish in the study, I think we were able to validate the concept of SEPs and shown how SEPs contribute to poverty reduction and women economic leadership. Um, as a recommendation, I think the WELL framework is well on the economic and market level, but if we, we saw that it did not capture as well how the SEPs are actually contributing to empowering women in the communities. So in the non-market or you know non-economic spheres, because there are those qualitative impacts that are difficult to capture or measure, but it's actually something that's very tangible. And in, even in anecdotal um, uh, anecdotes, you know, it's very palpable when we speak to uh, the social enterprises or even the beneficiaries uh, directly when I'm on field. Um, further study is on transactional and transformational social inclusion services that have in, and how they impact on the poor. So while the earlier study of uh, Professor Dakanai identified two, in this study we uh, identified the third one, 
which we had termed social inclusion, which are those that target uh, or help to improve or lessen the vulnerability of the poor, such as um, healthcare, or improve immediately their uh, quality of life. Mm, actually, there are others, <laughs> but um, my time is up. I'm over by two, three minutes, <laughs> Professor Q. Thank you for listening. Um, I think three. 30, 30, uh, in terms of the number of the poor, uh, no, the number of the poor is about three, three million. But then in the study of BSP and mixed market, uh, seven million, and then BSP and mixed market about three point six million. So that's for the outreach based on their studies. Uh, here in the report, it says that um, in Philippines, uh, the place number of social enterprise in the country that providing various programs around thirty thousand. Ah, that's the number of enterprises. I think her question is the outreach of the number of poor. 30,000 reaching how many? Yeah. Ah, now, the 30,000, uh, we did not estimate for the 30,000. We estimated per sector. So for the social cooperatives, based on CDA last of 2013, there are 23,672. And since we're focusing on the social cooperatives, we're not assuming all those cooperatives have the, are social. Um, based on first-hand data in the RISE uh, or action paper, uh, Victor is um, said about 18 out of the 38 who were operating in the Yolanda affected areas are social. So taking that percentage and taking what is 38% of the registered 23,000 or almost 24,000 with CDA, that's how we estimated 11,000 social cooperatives. So that's all approximates based on the data we could get from the rapid appraisal and from key informants. So it may be far, but uh, that's the closest we could get because it's not, the data is not available anywhere. So as we were saying, it would be good if we could try to put uh, this information together as it is not easy. For the MFIs, so we are basing more, more or less from MCPI, Oikocredit as a big social investor, the number of those who are actively participating in social performance initiatives and are intent or serious in following through on their social mission is the approximate number of uh, MFIs that we say are social. So we, they're all approximate. So we did not actually did do for uh, the 30,000 um, sets or social enterprises. I hope that answers your question. I'm Apple Tabige from Davao. And I'm from uh, the cooperative sector, farmers. Uh, how do you qualify social cooperatives? Because there are a lot of cooperatives, so what are your uh, key, key qualifications that you can say that they are social cooperatives? Thank you. Uh, part of the criteria we uh, mentioned about uh, social cooperatives is that first they have a significant outreach. Uh, they have um, quali the qualitative impact on the poor. And uh, those that are, um, yeah. So, and as a social cooperative, we classify those that are social, focused on their social mission. Uh, and one of the things that we looked at is the vision, mission of the uh, organization, objectives, plus also the programs and services. So uh, that's how we try to look at um, the classi classify the social cooperatives. I know that the CDA, of course, have, have its social audit. And in the microfinance sector, there are also tools to uh, actually um, not certify, but at least to, to qualify those who are really social. So but based on the study, these are what we actually just use as uh, to use the industry tools would actually be beyond the uh, scope and the budget of the project. Okay, thank you. 
I'm sorry I can't bring the mic to you. Maybe yeah. you can shout. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Vasi Malay from uh, Dan Foundation uh, yeah. India. I think studies uh, really captures a micro perspective. I think we need a, a macro perspective also needed in the study where uh, the social enterprises, uh, how do you classify? You have got a five categories here. No? Similarly, in those categories, what is the total overall profile of the social enterprise? Because there are nomenclatures are different. We come out of the NGOs, civic societies, all kinds of sectors. I think that confusion has to be really addressed quickly. So the part one of your study should include the kind of macro picture. So what is the status of social enterprises? And which again, with the secondary data available, we could really try that. <coughs> Thank you, uh, the noted, uh, but as uh, we mentioned, we were trying to just focus uh, on the, the se sector. And maybe that's a good recommendation and uh, one if we can take forward to be able to, to look at the macro perspective. Thank you. Uh, a question? <laughs> My name is Earl from the Philippines, from Negros. Uh, could you tell us more about uh, your conclusions, your the challenges regarding well, the women economic uh, leadership? Thing? Yes, um, it was very. What, in, in relation to well, it was very difficult to actually find steps that are uh, really focused on women, not having women as beneficiaries, because that's different. As women-led organizations um, that have already achieved a level of development that uh, y they can qualify as SEPs because most of those that we found in the Visayas, Mindanao, even in the Luzon and in the Yolanda affected areas, they are still at the level of that they are evolving. Mm, there are actually some organizations, some of them that are in the Great Women Project, which of course very uh, good initiative, but uh, because of the calamity, uh, whatever they have worked for the last years have been wiped out. So uh, some of them are starting again. So you say in, in terms of the uh, class, the nomenclature or the categorization of social enterprise, it's not really how long you've been around. It's also the stage where you're at and that you're able to, to reach out to provide those services to the poor. So um, another challenge uh, with uh, women economic leadership is the actual integration of the, the framework in the social enterprises is not very clear. Uh, many say that they have gender empowerment, women eco economic empowerment, but only one actually had a specific policy to include women in the board. In practice, they say, oh yeah, we have. And in fact, the data shows that almost all the SEPs um, have uh, women poor in the board and management levels, but only one actually had as a formalized it as a policy. In terms of gender programming, um, it's not there. Uh, they say, well, yeah, we have financial literacy, and since we have women as uh, beneficiaries, and you know, we are doing it. But as you know, we all know, succession changes in leadership. Anything can actually change the 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 direction and the focus if uh, it's not uh, documented and actually uh, formalized as a policy. And another thing is uh, people say, uh, most pro uh, social enterprises say they have uh, women, uh, economic empowerment or a gender thing, but you have uh, initiatives even supported by resource institutions, funders, that do not actually apply gender analysis in the programs. You have seaweed farmers and yet the, the, the workers are, are far, they're paid misly. So how can, how, even if you are targeting women to become beneficiaries and become actors of these enterprises you're trying to help or set up, they don't work there. Why? Because it's far from their houses. They're paid misly, they're paid daily. So again, you know, the, per then the perspective of knowing that you are, the, you are targeting women and uh, to, to improve women's condition is not actually um, applied in practice. I hope that answers your question earlier. Okay, we will take one last question. <laughs> okay, in the interest of keeping time. Okay. Oh, 
Uh, I'm Lolita Gel, Foundation for Disabled Person. I, in your report, there are only uh, around 44 percent or uh, lesser when it comes to SEs that ha have impact on increased uh, income on household. Uh, does this means that um, few SEs are really having impact on the increase of how uh, income in household or? Actually, we need to tie that in with the other question or the data that came up that most social enterprises uh, measuring social outcome is actually a challenge and my work uh, <laughs> trying to actually do that on field and helping organizations it's not easy so maybe some of the enterprises may hesitate to say because they're not able to measure and most do not have do not have baseline data so impact uh, studies or assessment is very difficult. So I, I would say that um, I don't think that it's not, the others are not actually, we're not able to make an impact in increasing household incomes because most of you, that's what you're trying to do. Uh, it's just that maybe there's that real challenge and you would and some do not, do not want to, you know, make a statement that they have that because if you cannot measure uh, it's difficult to manage, eh, to manage, right? So that's one one of the things I, I felt about that. So because it's um, conflicting in a sense, but that's actually also the limitation of the research. Um, we, we needed to to um, like validate and clarify some of the responses, uh, but in a survey that is, you know, quite. Um, comprehensive and uh, you're, you're reaching out to the organizations that are across the nation. Uh, that was really a challenge. But I think it would be very, very good if uh, from this conference there, there's some way that or an action plan can be made to help measure the impact of uh, these social enterprises. Okay. So thank you very much, Ms. Maldi, for a very engaging